Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody who's logged in this afternoon to this session with Dr. Troyer called Everything You Wanted to Know About Indians But Were Afraid to Ask. This is a webinar hosted by Ontario Library Service North. Uh, this is part of the First Nations series of webinars that we put on about once every month or so. I'd like to especially welcome Dr. Troyer. Dr. Anton Troyer is Professor of Ojibwe at Bemidji State University in Minnesota. His forthcoming book, Everything You Wanted to Know About Indians But Were Afraid to Ask, uh, is what he'll be speaking in part about today. Uh, he is also the editor uh, of Oshkabewish Native Journal, and it's the only academic journal of the Ojibwe language uh, that's published. Uh, and he's also the author of eight books. So I'm very grateful to have Dr. Troyer with us this afternoon. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Troyer. But I would like to remind folks that if you are listening online, if you want to mute your phones, please press star six. And if you want to unmute your phones, press pound six. Uh, you can also communicate throughout the webinar by using the online chat feature. Look for the speech bubble icon on the right side of your screen. So without further ado, uh, I will now turn it over to Dr. Troyer. Dr. Troyer, thank you for joining us. Aha, miigwech. Apiji ni miigwech renda ni ni miguanda. Maduan bangi goge kendo mano o. Apiji we bak mewenja. Ninda shwina wago shigo minwa migizi hindo de. I'm really grateful to everybody who was able to join us today. My my name is uh, Anton, and feel free to address me informally as Anton or Wagush if you uh, if you like to use the Ojibwe names. I uh, I like to start with a couple sentences in Ojibwe because my people much smarter and older than me often remind me that if we want to be native first and foremost, we should try to use our languages first and foremost. And uh, this is one of the areas where there's a lot of exciting developments going on. Uh, in uh, Aboriginal communities in Canada and the uh, Native communities in the United States as well. And one that gives me a lot of hope, but I think we need to bend a lot more uh, of our efforts and resources towards. I'm, I've really designed uh, today's presentation to be informal, and I really want to encourage you to ask any questions that you might have. And feel free to chime in verbally or throw things up on the uh, uh, on the chat windows, you just click on that um, talk bubble on the right-hand side of your screen there, and you can write in uh, any kind of question you might have. And I'll be happy to take those and, and let your interests uh, kind of guide our, our conversation, although I have plenty of material uh, to share with you as well. I guess, that, you know, this book really kind of started as part of a, a speaking series that I was doing, and <clears throat> one of the things I realized Growing up, uh, I'm from Leech Lake, which is one of the larger uh, reservations in Minnesota, and went to a school where, you know, about 30% of the students were Native, uh, but it was just astounding to me that, you know, the school would go, you know, three, two to 300 miles away on a school field trip and, and carefully avoid the indigenous communities nearby. And it seems strange that there was so little interaction between, you know, the, the non-Native communities, even the ones that were serving lots of Native students, for example, in the school, and the Native communities so close to them. Of course, you know, Indigenous people could sometimes be scary uh, to non-Native people, and rather than, you know, risk uh, offending anybody or uh, you know, take any perceived risks in a, a deeper interaction, there just wasn't a lot of that. And as a result, you know, Native people were, and I think to a large degree continue to be, largely imagined rather than deeply understood. So once, you know, a safe space is created where people could ask questions, and I found there were lots of questions, and Somewhere on very basic things, you know, such as do we use these words Indian, you know, First Nation, Aboriginal, Indigenous, Native American, or what? Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, just the terminology stuff alone would be uh, so confusing to some people that they felt they were kind of walking on eggshells and it wasn't safe 
to engage the deeper issues. So one of the purposes behind this book was to provide basic information, but then also some pointed discussions about more uh, serious topics that, that need our attention as well. Now I have lots of stuff I wanted to uh, to share with you guys, but let me begin first by asking, are there any burning questions right off the top? All right. If there are, again, feel free to chime right in or to write them up in the in the chat bubbles, and I'll be happy to take those. All right. So one of the one of the first questions that often does come up is, what kind of terminology do we use or should we use? And certainly in Canada, there's been a lot more um, thoughtful uh, discussion about what labels we should use, and uh, and there's been a kind of formal process to doing that. And as a result, words such as First Nation are kind of winning out, even over, you know, Aboriginal and so forth. In the United States, there's been much less of that. To me, you know, there are problems with just about every label that's out there. Um, even a word like Aboriginal, which isn't, you know, horribly offensive, sometimes gets confusing for people outside of Canada and its association with Australian Aborigines. And even terms like Indigenous, which are perfectly fine, you know, there are Indigenous people to every square inch of the planet. And, uh, you know, words like Indian, you know, obviously a misnomer when Christopher Columbus was lost and uh, thought he'd first he was in India, China, Japan, and the word, uh, you know, Indian stuck uh, and was continued to be misapplied to Native people in the Americas. Um, there was some discussion, by the way, a couple people, uh, Russell Means, Peter Matheson, have claimed that the word Indian was actually derived from uh, the Spanish words, un uh, gente en Dios, like uh, the people of God. And although, uh, you know, you can see how that sounds similar, uh, it's just not borne out by the historical record. Columbus was not calling Native people people of God. He was calling them Indians. But uh, uh, irregardless, there are problems with just about all the labels that are out there. And, and to me, what is most important is that we don't let discussion of labels or fear of offending people paralyze our ability to ask meaningful questions and give and receive meaningful answers and, and get to the deeper issues. So uh, I just think it's important that we're not walking around on eggshells. And I think a lot of people are. Um, one of the problems, you know, with our education systems in both Canada and the United States in regards to Native people is that a lot of teachers are so worried about offending somebody if they if they're not native and they're addressing native issues that it's simply safer and easier not to talk about it and as a result we perpetuate a system in which people can learn all about the rest of the world but never learn about themselves if they happen to be native and i think as much as the residential boarding school system uh this is an ongoing contributing major uh factor in you know, uh, disproportionately poor achievement rates for Native youth in, in our educational system and something that we really need to think critically about. All right. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat window, so I'm going to go ahead and start rolling through the uh, the presentation. But, again, feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, what I have here is just a series of slides that address some of the contemporary issues in uh, Indian country today and uh, feel free to chime in with comments and questions as we go. All right, so one of, the, one of the issues that comes up, and this is probably a bigger issue in the United States than it is in, in Canada, but it's, it's everywhere, is the issue of using Native people as mascots for uh, sports teams, uh, for schools, and so forth. And I guess the first thing to say, and I should really say this about everything that I'm going to share with you today, is that there is no one native view on any of these subjects. And I will be able to share with you my view as a native person, uh, but that's just one person's view. And, you know, no white person could speak for all white people and say, here's what white people think about abortion and give you one simple, easy answer. Of course, there is a diversity of opinion. 
those opinions are emotionally charged and so too are some of the subjects you know that we'll be discussing today whether it's casinos you know or mascots or whatever so i'll be happy to share my opinion but uh you know take it as that is there a question there okay um so i guess the bottom line you know some of the sports teams will use the names of a tribe or words like Indian. The picture on the right-hand side of this slide is for the Cleveland Indians and their chief Wahoo, who's the mascot for the team. And this poster was developed by uh, the National Coalition Against Racism in Sports and Media. I guess my feeling is that, you know, even though not everybody feels offended or has a problem with the use of Native people as mascots, for sports teams and uh, and so forth, some people do. And if something is significantly offensive for a significant portion of the population, then it doesn't seem necessary to push that issue or to hold on to, you know, uh, a sports mascot that's upsetting some people. And uh, I don't think this is just political correctness gone awry but an important step in creating places that are welcoming exactly. to all human beings. I'm going to put an Indian head under there, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And some of the fights have been really, really involved, like at North Dakota State, you know, the Fighting Sioux nickname, they had a very wealthy benefactor who said, I will withdraw all of my funding if you change the name. And then the, uh, you know, the, the organization that sanctions collegiate sporting events said, if you don't get rid of your racist mascot, we will not let you play in certain tournaments and games. And so then they were going to take it away again. Uh, and then there was such a, a fervor of alumni protest to the use of um, or to the discontinuation of the Fighting Sioux nickname that it's still in place and the battles have raged on for many years. And I think many of the people would rather just have the whole argument go away. But I guess to me, you know, they used to use other races as mascots as well. Uh, back in the, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, there was kind of this caricature of, of black people, the little black Sambo. And they had teams that had such a, a nickname and so forth. But that's all long since been discontinued. And I think the high percentage of representation from black people in many uh, sports has helped uh, generate a greater sensitivity about that. But Native people are underrepresented in just about every aspect of modern media and, and sporting events and so forth. And so as a result, there just hasn't been a lot of help from the outside to fight this particular issue, and it's kind of drug on and persisted long after you think it, uh, it should have. So I'm I'm hopeful, you know, you wouldn't, you know, you just wouldn't dare, you know, have people dressing up in hokey afros and making fun of black people at a sporting event and saying that it's, you know, honoring black people. But for some reason, you can still have a chief wahoo and you can still have teams called the Redskins and, and you can still have people who actually think that it's honoring somebody. So befuddling to me, one of the battles that's ongoing, there's been progress too, you know, there are several hundred schools that have changed uh, or somehow muted their nicknames. Uh, and sometimes there are Native people who don't weigh in uh, themselves and a lot of other people who resist it. So, you know, this has been ongoing. But I think progress is slowly being made. Opinions are slowly being changed and formed. And, and to me, this speaks also to a larger issue with Native people, which is, you know, something like the Civil Rights Movement really did do a lot for uh, black Americans. And one of the great successes of that organization was that, you know, when Martin Luther King was walking on the, the National Mall with a quarter of a million people, you know, at least a third of them were white. And it really makes a difference when there's outside support or outside outrage when something's not going well uh, to generate um, attention in the ways that it needs to be. Were there uh, other questions or comments on the mascots issue? All right, there's plenty more to share. I uh, This is a poster that went up uh, in November of 2010, right before Thanksgiving. 
in St. Paul, Minnesota, and it was an advertisement for a bar. And I, I think this one speaks to some of the other pervading opinions about Native people uh, that we need to address. And uh, you can see here, you know, the the pilgrim guy, the, the kind of cowboy guy, happy. He's a happy drunk. And then you got the Indian guy who can't handle his liquor. He's passed out cold. You've got, uh, you know, the sexual objectification of Native women. And then, you know, the slogans and everything else that it speaks to. Now, hello, you know, we have substance abuse issues in Indian country. Uh, we have also some pretty profound gender issues going on in Indian country. Most crimes in the world are white on white, black on black, and so forth. But crimes of sexual violence are one of the only exceptions. Most white women who've been raped have been raped by white men. Most black women who've been raped have been raped by black men. Most native women who've been raped have been raped by white men. And I think this, you know, the sexual objectification of Indian women is really uh, problematic uh, and an ongoing issue, as well as the way that this speaks to stereotypes about Native people. And, uh, uh, you know, there was quite a protest about the poster, although no formal legal actions, it was ultimately retracted. Um, but these are the sort of things that when they happen, not only does it hurt the feelings of some Native people or perpetuate stereotypes, but when you're trying to heal the relationship between Native nations and their people and the United States government and their citizens, something like this can just take you back, you know, 30 years. And Native people retract and say, why should I reach out? Why should I interact? Why should I spend my time teaching you? You don't understand me. You never will. Uh, and a lot of damage can be done with these sort of things. By the way, I don't know how many of you may have kind of done a session uh, or had some thinking about what people call white privilege. But, you know, a lot of times people bristle at even the subject because they say, well, if I'm I'm white, but I don't feel privileged. If anything, I feel, you know, beset and attacked and sometimes asked to atone for the sins of my ancestors, which are not my sins. Uh, and it's sometimes it is actually very hard being white. Uh, and so, you know, some of the things that are meant by that term white privilege are little things like you can go into a store and buy flesh-colored Band-Aids and they'll more or less match the color of your skin. That's a little privilege to being white. But there are bigger privileges, too. You know, and they include, you know, walking into a bar and seeing 200 inebriated white college co-eds, and nobody's going to think, oh, white people are all drunks. But you can see 200 inebriated white college co-eds and one Native person there, and someone's going to think Indians have a problem with alcohol, and some people are going to not only think it but say it or act on it or come up with posters like this. So I, I think that uh, you know, speaks to some of the problems we got going on in Indian country. We do have real problems, uh, but it's ironic, too. You know, we have the very best and the very worst that you know, Indian country has to offer, and it's all in the same place. But if we want to get to the point where we have really constructive conversations and can really um, you know, arrive at a point of healing, I think it's really important to address some of the stereotypes and provide tools and avenues for people to learn meaningful things, whether they're Native or not, about Native history, language, culture, and the good things that we have to offer there, too. Any comments or questions there? Okay. One of the subjects that I get asked to talk about a lot is the issue of uh, of education. And, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the fact that both the Canadian government and the United States government had residential boarding school uh, policies that were designed to assimilate Native people and are aware that 
not all Native people had a positive experience in those schools. And I guess that's probably putting it very mildly. Um, in Canada, of course, there was an official apology and an effort at making reparations around this that's brought a lot of testimony and, and information into public view, including pretty endemic and widespread issues of uh, sexual abuse of minors at the schools and so forth. Uh, in the United States, the policy began earlier uh, in the late 1800s, uh, but it ended a little bit earlier than it did in Canada. Sometimes it surprises people, too, that the residential boarding schools in the United States at Carlisle, Haskell, and other places actually kept cemeteries for the children. Uh, and I don't know how many people could imagine sending your child to school and not even getting their body back for funeral. Uh, but that is what happened to many hundreds of children at the schools, um, a pretty devastating impact. The impacts were many. Um, so I'm not going to go on too much about the residential boarding schools because we could fill up the entire time doing that. But the impacts were not just, you know, negative experiences or physical beatings for the speaking of tribal languages, but the widespread impact were that it generated a profound distrust uh, among many Native people of government officials, government institutions, of educational officials, teachers, and educational institutions. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, I'll see this like where there, maybe there's a non-Native teacher working for one of the reservation schools, and they'll be like, look, I, I'm a teacher, and I can teach who shows up to my class, but there's a truancy problem. And I don't understand why the kids aren't coming to class. I don't understand why the parents don't come to the parent-teacher conferences. Don't they care? Uh, and if they don't understand this entire dynamic, it's not just demographics that Native families are having 4.4 kids per household instead of 1.2 kids per household, and there's a disproportionate share of single-parent families and things like that. It's not just that or the issues of poverty, but it's the issues that a lot of Native people feel incredibly uncomfortable and distrustful of educational institutions and of educators. And I know for myself, you know, as a, as a dark Native person from the reservation going to school, uh, when I went, wanted to go off to college, many of my peers said, oh, well, he's an apple now. He's red on the outside, but he's white on the inside. And there was a negative association with the pursuit of higher education. And so I think there's tremendous damage done by the residential boarding school system that we are only now starting to address. And when you look at what we do in education today, now some of the issues are very parallel in the United States and in Canada, although in the United States we also have an education policy called No Child Left Behind which basically says that any, uh, all children have to take, you know, mandated tests, state mandated tests, um, and there's some variance from state to state. Uh, but at the same time, they have to test out at a certain level, and if they don't, then the teacher has failed and the school has failed. The problem with that is somebody could bring a kid from a first grade reading level to an 11th grade reading level in one year, but if the kid's in the 12th grade, that teacher still failed. So there's some big problems with no child left behind. But it is also engineered, you know, and put pressure on teachers to kind of teach to the test and emphasize math and reading, sometimes to the exclusion of other disciplines. But there's still threads, you know, strands for social studies and history and things like that. And Native people don't come up very often. In fact, I remember once asking my teacher, you know, what about the Indians? And the teacher responded, oh, that's who was here before, and went right on with her lesson. And I remember thinking, but I'm here now. And this is one of the profound problems that pervades our educational system is that uh, we do not provide many opportunities for Native people to learn about themselves. We get a sugar-coated version of Christopher Columbus, a sugar-coated version of Thanksgiving, and that's about it. And it's 
not the intention of those who have designed curriculum or those who have designed um, No Child Left Behind. It's not their intention to marginalize or out anybody, but it is the effect of those policies and those curricula to out and marginalize a lot of Native people. If you could imagine like this, you know, in the United States, if you look at the faces that grace, you know, every denomination of U.S. currency, with the exception of Hamilton and Franklin, they have all personally killed Indians. That's George Washington, wow. that's Abraham Lincoln, that's Andrew Jackson, Ulysses S. Grant. They've all personally killed Indians with their own hands. And they have all also engineered policies that have been horribly detrimental to Native people. You know, so, uh, you know, yeah. George Washington, you know, had an active hand in, uh, you know, a war against the Iroquois Confederacy and a civil war that broke out amongst them. Uh, the, you know, Abraham Lincoln signed the largest mass execution order in the history of the United States, and that was 38 Dakota men hung simultaneously by the neck until dead day after Christmas in 1862, and also served as a captain in the in the Black Hawk War. Uh, and Andrew Jackson engineered removal policy, Cherokee Trail of Tears. But these are the guys that our kids are taught to worship, to respect, and going to school and constantly learning, here are the heroes of the Western world, not yours. Here are the great cultures of the Western world, not yours. And here are the important events of the world, not yours. The important languages, cultures, not yours. It's not the intent to out people, but what it does is it engineers a very consistent blow to self-esteem. And so a lot of Native people, both from the residual distrust of educators and educational institutions from residential boarding schools and from the way that Native kids are taught today, have that distrust reinforced. And so the teachers are handicapped because they're sitting there scratching their heads wondering how come the Native families aren't engaging with the school and how come the kids don't want to be here. But they have no idea that it's not just, you know, best practices. It's not just that, you know, Native people might put their head down rather than look directly at the teacher to show a sign of respect. It's not just that stuff. It's the very substance of what's being taught and how it is being taught. And so, uh, so I think, you know, we've got a lot of work to do in, uh, in education there. All right. I see Brendan's got a, got a hand up there. You got a question or comment? Yeah, there are a couple of questions in the, in the chat box. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you missed them there, but I can read them for you if you wish. Uh, yeah, I am. Let me see here. I'm seeing Q&A group. Oh, let me see if I put it all. I guess I'm not seeing the questions in the chat group. So go ahead and read them to me. Okay. There's a question from Francine. Uh, she's asking if the word Indian is considered a lack of respect or a direct insult. Okay. Yeah, it'll depend on who you're speaking to. Um, some people will say, you know, I am Anishinaabe, I am Ojibwe, I am not an Indian. Uh and so, you know, certainly the, the very safest things you can do are, are use the terms for each tribe that they have chosen and stuck with. So terms like Anishinaabe, Ojibwe are very safe and well accepted. The problem is, you know, you can sound a little Ojibwe-centric because not everybody's Ojibwe. Yeah. And we need terms that can refer to all indigenous people. Um, so some people might take an issue with it. I think most don't. Um, there's been an effort to kind of prefer Native American and, or Indigenous or for a while they're Aboriginal in Canada. Um, and again, I see some problems with those, but to me what's most important, and you'll hear me use them all pretty interchangeably myself, to me what's most important is that we have respect for one another and that we don't paralyze the conversation. I want people to feel safe uh, asking any question they would ever want to know about Indians and and I would want myself and any other Native person to give a meaningful answer rather than an angry, you know, admonition. There's another question uh, from Krista, which actually might be good to, to place right now. Is Krista there that she could actually ask it herself? No? 
Okay, I'll read it for you then. Uh, Krista has asked, uh, she's talking about at her her library, she's working on putting together a, a First Nations, Métis, and Inuit space in their library. Mm -hmm. And she's working with schools uh, connected to the public library and also the local First Nations communities to put that together. Um, she's indicated that it's quite a slow process, but it's been successful in building relationships between these communities. Mm -hmm. She was wondering if you had any, any kind of advice or would like to comment on, on that kind of uh, exercise, uh, particularly as it might relate to, you know, you were just talking about education there and how education often feeds into some of, some of these problems that exist. Um, mm -hmm. Libraries, I think, need to be conscious of this too. So, um, has some... So. Yeah. You know, I think it is really, really, not just great, but really important that um, Native people and Native communities engage other people and other organizations for support, for help, um, and vice versa. You know, we're going to continually have a disconnect until we can have meaningful communication. And frankly, there are way too few Native people to really do all of the work that needs to be done all by themselves. You know, we had a lot of progress in the United States around civil rights when the civil rights movement kind of pushed through some really meaningful legislative reforms. And you finally had a lot of black people emerging, uh, writing books, uh, giving speeches, becoming president of the United States, uh, and so forth. And Native people are so few in number and so few of of the Native people have arrived in positions of economic authority, of academic authority, of political authority, that we need people to understand our minds and hearts and help us advocate the important issues because there is no way for us to do it all ourselves. And, and in Indian country, you also have a further complication, which is that, you know, Native people who do get degrees and do gain skill sets, have a natural impulse to go home and help their people rather than engage with the rest of the world first and foremost, you know, and, and that's a good thing, but it also means that on the outside, we continue to be imagined rather than understood, and we need other people to push exactly these sorts of programs to facilitate meaningful communication and, and help develop resources, you know, at the same time, you know, I have sometimes been frustrated when, you know, there are a lot of the books that were written about Native history, for example, were written by not just non-Native people. I don't think that, you know, should include or exclude anybody automatically, but without any communication with Native people. You know, like if you want to write a book on German history, you are going to Germany, you are going to operate fluently and be completely literate in German, as well as French and English, and if you don't, you will be disgraced in your profession. But you can write however many books you want on indigenous history without going to indigenous communities, knowing anything about tribal languages, uh, and without talking to tribal oral historians, only basing your books on the archival records of, you know, French and British fur traders and politicians and so forth. That's a pretty amazing dynamic, and that's one that, you know, needs to change. But I certainly welcome anyone's efforts, regardless of their race, um, background or institutional affiliations to, uh, you know, forward the conversation. We, we're all in this together and we need to help each other. Good. That's, uh, that's all the questions that I've seen right now. So I'll let you go back to, uh, yeah. prepared remarks. Thank you. Yeah. And just, uh, you know, go ahead and, you know, stick a hand up or chime in if, uh, if I'm not seeing anything on the chat window. Mine's, yeah, for some reason not showing me everyone else's, but. Yeah, so, you know, I think we have a lot of work to do, you know, in education about reforming, you know, scope standards, objectives, outcomes, benchmarks kind of stuff. I think we also have to reform the way we're doing curriculum. And until we make our schools places where, you know, Native kids can go and learn about themselves and the rest of the world, then our educational institutions will continue to be forwarding an agenda of assimilation. And I think that's really problematic, and that's at the heart of the disconnect. 
And I could give you a pretty interesting example. Um, there's been some really exciting uh, recent work going on around issues of tribal language revitalization. And some tribes are further along than others. But in Wisconsin, um, they started the first Ojibwe language immersion school in, in the U.S. And they've been going for about 12 years now. And the, around 50 percent of the native kids in the public school in that community are failing their tests in English, math, and, and so forth. And the same thing with the, the regular tribal school. About 50 percent of the kids are underperforming academically. At this Ojibwe language immersion school, they actually have a 100 percent pass rate in state-mandated tests in English every year in a row for 11 years in a row. And the, the kids who've been in the school the longest, the oldest age cohort, have a 100% pass rate at the exceptional level. All of these tests are administered in English to test competency in English. Their teachers only teach them in Ojibwe. But for some reason, their pass rates are astronomically higher than the native kids in any of the other institutions in the area. And that says a lot. You know, even, even the, like, like the wealthy, predominantly white suburban schools in the Twin Cities don't get results that good. And so it says a few things, you know. When people go to school and do get a chance to learn about themselves as well as the rest of the world, and by the way, the charter for that school says we will meet all state-mandated curriculum guidelines, we'll just do it in Ojibwe. <laughs> so they're not, they're not like changing the curriculum and only teaching them certain things or whatever. Uh, they're just doing it in their own language. So it just, doing it this way tends to generate, you know, self-esteem, which translates into respect, you know, into success at everything across the curriculum. The parents who might be standoffish and, and distrustful of educational institutions all of a sudden feel welcomed because of the language and culture activity going on there. Uh, and so there are many things about that model that show a lot of promise. And we can point to a thousand different things that are not working in our efforts to educate Native youth in the U.S. and Canada, but if there are a few things that are working, maybe we should pay attention to that. And, uh, and certainly the language and culture piece it has been working, so we should pay attention. On the slide in front of you, you can see um, a couple pictures there. On the right-hand side, this is a lithograph that accompanied the English version of a book by Bartolome de las Casas, who was with uh, Christopher Columbus on his second voyage and then stayed in uh, the Americas afterwards. And what happened is, uh, on, starting on Columbus's second voyage, the Spanish were based primarily out of the island uh, that's now Haiti in the Dominican Republic. They called Española. And they instituted a gold dust tribute requiring each native person to bring, uh, you know, a thimble full of gold dust four times a year. And the problem was Native people had some gold there, but their gold trinkets were acquired in trade with tribes from mainland Mexico. So in a short period of time, all the gold was gone, and anything else that was left in precious minerals was deep in the earth and inaccessible to them. So the Spanish instituted a uh, not only the tribute, but started chopping off the hands of people who failed to meet their gold dust quota. And they cut the hands off of 30,000 Native people uh, just during Columbus's second voyage alone. The Spanish had estimated the indigenous population of Española, that one island, at 2 million people, and it was reduced to around 30,000 people within 30 years and the remaining people absorbed into the Spanish population or killed off uh, in the subsequent wow. decades. So it was genocide. And this is all really well documented. Uh, de Las Casas wrote several books and uh, well-documented information in there. Columbus kept copious notes and journals, and it's well-documented in there. And my real question is, you know, since we know that this picture on the right is what was happening, why are we teaching with this picture on the left? You know, and you've got, you know, Christopher Columbus with his hands up and a big smile and the Indian welcoming him, Chris, you know. And in 1492, Chris Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And, you know, that's kind of 
celebrate his arrival in discovery of the new world. You know, and this was, by the way, I pulled it right out of uh, a curriculum packet being used in the Milwaukee public schools uh, in the 1990s when I was teaching there. And, you know, of course, how can you discover a place that's densely inhabited by other human beings? You know, but it's much deeper than that. We do have a propensity to sugarcoat the ugly chapters in our history. And there were some ugly chapters. And it's really important to acknowledge that the ugly chapters happened as an entry point for, for healing. And for Native people, I don't know, you know, maybe a good analogy would be if there was a, a man and woman who were married, and let's say that the, you know, the man went out and cheated on his wife. If there was an effort to reconcile that relationship, it could not start with, hey, honey, forget all about it. It happened in the past. It would have to start with, I did you wrong. I'm really sorry. It's never going to happen again. And then there's a small chance that they could reconcile that relationship. But oftentimes with indigenous issues, with these ugly chapters, there's been a tendency among a lot of people to say, hey, that all happened in the past, just forget about it. And what's neglected in the, in the so-called solutions is, it, is an understanding of what we call historical trauma. Someone's been pounding Native people in the head with a hammer for many, many decades, and when you stop pounding them in the head with a hammer, it doesn't mean that the wound is automatically healed. You know, and then every time there's a new effort to, you know, limit official discourse to English in the United States or English and French in, in Canada uh, to the exclusion of tribal languages, then that ruffles feathers and takes us back, you know, a long ways in the healing process. Canada's done a little better than the United States in the sense that there have been official apologies about residential boarding schools. There has been an effort, uh, you know, to set things right, to, you know, quantify the problem and provide some reparations. There's mixed feelings about that. Some Native people feel you can't buy off what you did to me. This is too little, too late. Uh, but it's an effort, and it's more effort than we've seen in the United States. And I guess I feel like we have, you know, here in the United States, we have to say, you know, this country is founded on genocidal policies towards Native people and the exploitation of black labor and slavery, and those things are morally repugnant. And I say that because I do love my country and because I want to make sure that those things don't happen again. Um, I got a from that. Yeah, I got it from the schools. <laughs> or the, the immersion schools. Are you still there? Yep. Uh, there's a question from, from Francine. Uh, she was asking about the uh, school that you you referenced earlier, the Ojibwe, uh, Ojibwe language school, and she was wondering about the student-teacher ratio, if you have any, any idea of, of how large the student body might be. Yeah. Um, the teacher-student ratio is a little bit better than, um, than many of the public schools. Like here in the States, a lot of the public schools may have 30 to 1 on a, on a teacher-student ratio, and it's almost half of that at the charter school, uh, the Ojibwe Immersion Charter School. Uh, they don't get extra funds. Um, they're not funded by a tribe, and they are um, they only receive the per pupil funding that any public school district would receive. Uh, but they're writing grants like crazy and trying to raise additional funds. So that's kind of like feast and famine. But uh, when they get extra grants, they hire additional help uh, in the you know, directly in the classrooms, and they try to keep classes from getting too big, um, you know, so that they can manage that and, and maintain Ojibwe airtime and so forth. Uh, there are other challenges with those immersion schools, like um, most of our fluent speakers here are elders, and most of the certified teachers are not. Uh, so finding somebody who's a certified teacher and a fluent speaker is a pretty rare find. Uh, there are some. Uh, and most of them are working in the immersion schools. But uh, a lot of times they end up having a fluent speaking elder paired up with a certified teacher who's a second language learner, and they share airtime and work together, uh, which helps because a lot of times somebody who's an elder and a fluent speaker may not have the energy to run with second graders all day long. Uh, 
uh, may not have the skill sets to develop curriculum, scope, sequence, objectives, outcomes, you know, integrated assessments and stuff like that, um, but they know how to speak Ojibwe, they know the language, they know the culture, uh, and so it kind of helps having both skill sets in the room, even if it takes two people to cover them both. Thanks. No other questions at this time. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, and flip on. I guess you know the only other thing that occurs to me in in um, is a major issue. Oh, by the way, here's let me see if I got this in two forms or just put one in there. Um, yeah, you know, with uh, it's a little hard for you guys to see on this thing here, but this was the quincentenary uh, of Christopher Columbus, the 500th anniversary, and just some of the underlined words really say a lot. You know, so you've got uh, momentous year, greatest achievements of human endeavor, discovery of the new world, discovery, great courage, determination, Christopher Columbus Quincentenary Jubilee Commission, great navigator, commemoration milestone, open the door to a new world, set an example for us all, monumental feats, perseverance, faith, support the Quincentenary. And I guess to me, um, you know, this is a problem that we have uh, so much celebration of such an ugly chapter in history. And I think a lot of the kids going to school might not know the entire story of Columbus, but they'll just know there's something wrong with an effort to sugarcoat it. And, uh, you know, I saw this when I was traveling in Germany and Austria, and I was trying to find a concentration camp, you know, and I eventually found Dachau concentration camp outside the city of Munich, but there were no road signs until you were a kilometer away. You know, same thing when I was looking for Mauthausen in Austria, which is adjacent to Germany and it joined with Germany early in World War II, and couldn't find it until, you know, you're about two kilometers away and you saw the first sign. But if you go to Poland and you're looking for Auschwitz, then the signs are 200 kilometers and 150 and 175, 50, 25, you know, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Look what the Nazis did to us. So I think it is natural for any individual not to want to dwell upon the ugly chapters in their life, and it's natural for any country not to want to dwell on the ugly chapters in their history. But, you know, the Germans had to make financial reparations to Jewish Holocaust survivors. They had to issue formal apologies and mandate instruction about the history in their school system. And I think that's an important step for us to take in Canada and the United States would be to mandate instruction about this history in our school system uh, as, a, as a means of preventing it from happening again and as a means of successfully engendering academic achievement for Native youth. By the way, the ugly chapters in history are not just ignored. Sometimes they get celebrated. And uh, here's an example. This is the great feel for the uh, territory of Wisconsin. And for a time, Wisconsin and Minnesota were all one territory. It's a little hard to see on this image, but here you have the white farmer industriously plowing up the land. And he's using his horse-drawn plow there. This is an image of an Indian here, and the Ho-Chunk, also known as Winnebago Indians, were one of the tribes from Wisconsin, actually endured nine separate removal orders, one of which they boarded, uh, were boarded onto steamships and sent down the Mississippi, up the Missouri, to Santee, Nebraska. And here's an image of an Indian heading west, getting onto a steamship, so that image of relocation is enforced in the territorial seal for Wisconsin. You've got the state house looming in the background, and if you know your Latin, this says it all. Civilization succeeds barbarism. Right. So it's not just the case that the ugly chapters were ignored or people are ashamed of them. Oh Sometimes they've even been celebrated. Yeah. By the way, Wisconsin just changed their state seal because this image was incorporated in the state seal for uh, Wisconsin for many, many years uh, with their sesquicentennial. But, uh, uh, wow. you know, pretty pretty disturbing that that would persist for so long. And there are many other examples like that. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about residential boarding schools. This is just a picture of uh, Captain Richard Henry Pratt. 
who engineered the residential boarding school system in the United States, which was uh, the primary inspiration for the system in Canada as well. And his famous quote was, our goal is to kill the Indian in order to save the man. By the way, Pratt really, he didn't see Indians as, um, you know, he didn't, didn't want to hurt Indians. He thought he was helping them with the residential boarding school system. He, he really believed that the religion, culture, belief systems of Native people were what were holding them down and that you had to remake Native people in an entirely different image. The problem with, you know, residential boarding schools is that, you know, in addition to the distrust that Native people developed for education, going to school sometimes from, you know, age 6 to age 18 with lots of discipline and very little nurture puts a huge tear in the social fabric. People learn how to parent by how they're parented. And that doesn't mean you're going to be the same exact kind of parent that yours were, but you learn your skill sets young. You develop a sense of what is normal young. You know, if you grow up eating in front of the TV, that feels normal. If you grow up eating in, you know, at a table, that feels normal. And what happens when you have so much discipline and so little nurture? It puts a big tear in the social fabric. And then the people who in their wisdom developed this system also completely ignored the fact that there was a racial barrier to gainful employment for people of color prior to World War II when they were doing this in the 1800s all the way through the World War II era. And so the economic opportunities that were promised also never materialized. This is Carlisle, one of the schools uh, in the United States in the 1800s. And they had they were bringing in 20,000 Native kids every year. Carlisle had 58 different tribes represented. And they were just churning through the kids. And some years, like in 1918, there was a worldwide flu epidemic. And 300 kids at this one school died and were buried at the school. That was just one year. So uh, so pretty pretty rough history. You know, they included the physical makeover. Um, and so it's some pretty some pretty tough chapters in history. You'll probably be hearing a lot more about uh, what was happening in 1862 in Minnesota. And maybe before I jump into that, I should ask: Are there any other questions on the on the education piece? Yeah, well, if you do think of something, feel free to uh, to chime away, and I'll be happy to to address the issues. Um, but you know, there's some other chapters in uh, in the history in the United States that were pretty profound. And um, uh, in 1862, the Dakota Indians from southern Minnesota had a major conflict with the United States government. And by major, I mean four to four, between four and eight hundred white civilians were killed. Uh, t around two thousand Dakota people were killed, and the remaining Dakota were forcibly evicted from Minnesota. And then the largest mass execution in U.S. history, which is what this image is of, uh, with thirty-eight Dakota men hung uh, simultaneously in Mankato, Minnesota, uh, at the order of President Abraham Lincoln. So, uh, you know, Lincoln, by the way, gets a, gets a good rap in the United States for everything from freeing the slaves to ending the Civil War and uniting the country. But in Indian country, a lot of times there's a very different perspective. And there was a pretty, some pretty ugly chapters in this history. We're coming up on the anniversary, uh, you know, the big 150th anniversary of this event. So there'll be a lot more movies, documentaries, books, and so forth coming out. There was a lot going on uh, in Ojibwe country during this time period as well. And I could really spend a couple hours just kind of going through everything that happened in this event leading up to it and, and the entire aftermath. But I think it really uh, says a lot about uh, U.S. Indian policy and then coming right out of the U.S. Dakota conflict where the very famous wars for the plains and so forth. This is a picture of Little Crow, and he was uh, one of the Dakota chiefs who was active in the the conflict. At first, he said, you know, he had traveled to Washington several times, and he told his people, if you embark on this path, we're all going to die, you know. But in the end, he said, you know, if you all want to die, we might as well die fighting. 
and he ended up joining them and leading the conflict. And uh, Little Crow was quite a statesman, uh, and he knew what was happening, but conditions in southern Minnesota were so terrible at that point in time that people were boiling their moccasins to try to make soup, hoping they could eke some sort of nutrition from it. The Civil War was ongoing, and the government withheld the monies that they were supposed to be paying the Dakota Indians for the sale of land so that they could divert those resources to the war effort. Uh, and, you know, the event really began over a simple uh, simple thing where four young Dakota men were on a white farm trying to steal eggs, and the wife of the farmer came out with a broom and chased them off. And uh, uh, one of them got whacked with the broom, and the other guys were laughing at that guy. And so he went back and killed the farmers and uh, came to his people and said, you know, should we surrender or what should we do? And uh, they all, some of them wanted to just go to war rather than die of starvation. And Little Crow tried to discourage them, but in the end ended up joining with them. Uh, it was a brutal and terrible event for all people involved, but most especially for the Dakota, uh, who have still never recovered in terms of population, land, political power. By the way, Little Crow himself escaped into Canada, and you know, uh, Canada was part of the British Empire, and uh, the British were financially supporting the Confederacy during the re during the uh, U.S. Civil War, and so you know, Union troops were not going to go marching into Canada and start fighting the British all at the same time. So, uh, so that held them off. And Little Crow came back to the United States uh, into North Dakota to uh, uh, try to meet with some friends uh, and family members over there. And he was shot and killed by a farmer who didn't even know his identity. He just saw an Indian on his farm. And when he went up to the body, he recognized this was Little Crow. Uh, reported it to the U.S. Army, and they had a price tag on his head. Uh, and so the Army came and retrieved uh, Little Crow's uh, body. They scalped him, uh, drug his body through the streets of a nearby town for the 4th of July parade, uh, brought him to Minnesota, and they had his body macerated, which is really boiled until the flesh came off the bones, uh, and then put on display in the... Minnesota Historical Society. And on, on the left is a postcard. They tanned the scalp after they had scalped Little Crow. And so this is his scalp. And these are postcards that were being sold by the Minnesota State Historical Society through the 1970s. That's disgusting. It is disgusting. It's And, you know, one of the most amazing things is that this didn't stop. In the 1970s, there was a, an Ojibwe guy from White Earth who was working for the Minnesota Human Rights Commission at the time. And he was approached by this elderly Dakota man who said, I need your help. And he said, okay, what do you need help with? And he said, I need you to go into the Minnesota Historical Society and get a picture of Little Crow's skeleton. And now David Bolio thought this was the craziest thing he had ever heard of in his life. And he said, well, you know, why on earth would you want me to get a picture of, of the skeleton? And he said, well... Uh, they just took it off of display. It's been on display for all of these, you know, years. It had been, you know, it had been a very, very long time. Now, by the 1970s, it had been over 100 years. And so he says, um, you know, what, uh, uh, why would you want me to get a picture of these? He says, well, they took them off of display, and I want to make sure that they're intact. And Bolio says, well, why would you want to do that? And this guy says, oh, he's my grandfather. <laughs> Bolio's just kind of flabbergasted, what? You know, and here he had this huge stack of letters that he had written to the Historical Society and the Minnesota legislature and all this, asking for the repatriation of his grandfather's bones and scalp and so forth, and all of these denials that, no, these are the property of the state of Minnesota and so That's forth. Terrible. And then eventually, through Bolio, they, he won his case and the remains were repatriated. And Little Crow's grandson, who's now a very old man, um, passed away just uh, a year or so after that event. Uh, but these are the sort of things. Now, this is 1970s. is within the living memory of many, many Native people in Minnesota. And it just ruffles feathers. And then, you know, sometimes you get these comments like, why are Indians so angry all the time? Or, 
how come they don't want to engage the government on issues? Or how come they don't want to participate with, when the historical society wants to, you know, do a historical display or demonstration and educate about Indians with good intentions now, you know? And so, uh, you know, again, the historical trauma piece has to be understood and the whole history of, uh, you know, behind these things has to be understood in its context. Questions or comments? All right. I know some of that stuff is pretty, uh, I'm going to skip this one. I got, you know, some of the images are just kind of make better talking points. This is a pretty famous drawing of manifest destiny, that it's, you know, was the destiny of the United States of European powers to expand sea to shining sea and, you know, buffalo and Indians riding off into the sunset ahead of the, you know, inevitable progress of, you know, Europeans and so forth. Um, now, I know we're not going to have time to go through all of kind of Indian Studies 101. Um, and, Brandon, could you let me know how much time we do have? Still there? Hi there. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag when you're pressed uh, to unmute. Uh, we're oh, sure. at 3 o'clock now, so... Um at any point, if, if you if you want people want to come in with questions, or I mean, we can continue certainly. Um, yeah, I'm I'm at your disposal. Um, I'm not sure if there's a point in you know there's so much material to share, uh, you know, going through some of the legal history uh, and so forth. But really, I guess maybe the only major point I'd make at this stage on this is uh, there's some big differences between the United States and Canada and their respective. Uh, Indian policies. And one of the big differences in the United States is that the court systems affirm a nation-to-nation -nation relationship between tribes and the United States government. And as a result, state governments uh, and local governments have no authority over tribal affairs uh, unless the U.S. government specifically gives it to them. And so that's why, for example, states, uh, why tribes, for example, can create casinos even if the state laws around them say that, you know, casino gambling is illegal. And, uh, and there are many other attributes of state law that just don't apply in Indian country. In Canada, you know, there's, of course, a special acknowledgement and rights of Canadian First Nations, uh, but it's, for the most part, evolved through political means um, constitutional reform, the Assembly of First Nations, and it's been just configured a little bit differently than it has in the United States. Uh, and it's a little bit harder. If there's, like in the United States, there might be broad political resistance to tribal control over casinos, for example, but they just don't have the authority to stop it. Whereas in Canada, you know, there might be development, you know, uh, tribal you know, economic development initiatives and so forth, but those come about through political processes and have to get argued and justified all the time, and so it's just a little bit different. So the Marshall Trilogy was really the foundation for that, you know, affirmation of the legal status of U.S. tribes. Uh, there's so many things to talk about. You know, we are hurting on tribal languages. Uh, Ojibwe, which is, you know, uh, the language that I speak and work with the most is a big group of people, you know, and all the way from, you know, the Quebec uh, to Saskatchewan in Canada, there are scattered 125 Ojibwe First Nations. And in the United States, there are, you know, reservations from Michigan all the way out to North Dakota. Uh, and so there's a big swath of territory. Some of those communities, like in the OG Cree Severn area, have, you know, pretty close to 100% fluency. Lac La Croix, Ontario has about that. But almost everywhere else in the U.S. and Canada, we're in language crisis with Ojibwe. And they're really, we're down now to the point where there are only 20 tribal languages anywhere in the U.S. or Canada that are spoken by any number of children. And of those, there are about four that have any kind of vibrant populations of speakers. So if we're going to get an intervention going on tribal languages, it needs to happen now. And there is an intervention ongoing for some of those tribal languages. So certainly Crow is getting in good shape. Um, Diné or Navajo is in pretty good shape. 
Uh, and groups like Ojibwe and Hopi and others have been trying to join the fray and make progress. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're worried and rightfully worried, but I guess what I would say is that the future vitality of Ojibwe, for example, is not certain, but it is possible. And so, uh, I think that some of the really exciting work with the immersion schools and other things speaks well to that. Can you guys, if you guys can see my chats, I will um, drop in a few web links uh, to the Immersion School in Wisconsin, to a really good free video called First Speakers, uh, Restoring the Ojibwe Language, which is an Emmy Award winning video, uh, and it's free online view or free download. That will kind of give you a good idea of what's happening with language revitalization. And then in the materials that are already presented to you, there are links to my faculty page, which has, um, you know, books and other links and resources. There's lots more information out there than, than you might think. So you can, uh, if you want to stick around and look at the chat windows, and then I'll have that information for you. Here's the link on uh, first speakers restoring the Ojibwe language. And there's some pretty good stuff that uh, I think might help you understand what's happening and then maybe even advocate for its importance if uh, if that's something that you're interested in doing. There's some really great Ojibwe language resources. We even have now an online web-based free talking dictionary where you can go look up a word, click on the word, hear the word from a first speaker from naturally recorded speech, hear an example sentence uh, from naturally recorded speech, uh, and then it's interfaced with the Minnesota Historical Society's um, web-based archive. So if you're clicking on bandolier bag, then you'll get all their photographs of bandolier bags and historical information. It's really a fantastic resource. Uh, and so there's a lot of other things that are coming out that are really helping uh, improve the, the status of the language and provide tools for its teaching and revitalization. I guess the only thing significant on that is the date. And there's the new book. It'll be coming out this spring. I uh, hope it's of, of help to you. And I will also just avail myself to you individually if you guys have any questions uh, or, you know, you want to find some resources on a specific topic. And uh, I'll be happy to uh, avail myself to you guys going forward if there's anything I can do to help you with your own uh, work and endeavors, and certainly wish you, wish you all the best of luck. I'll stay on the line if there are any more questions, and I will drop in these uh, links in the chat windows uh, for you who are interested. Thank you so much. Miigwech.